The ICF Training and Technical Assistance Team is honored to welcome you to this California Housing and Community Development Training Session offered through the Emergency Solution Grant Coronavirus Relief Consulting and Staffing Services Contract. My name is Chris Pitcher. I'm from ICF, and I'll be hosting today's session. Today's training session is part of our community workshop series and is entitled ESG and the Violence Against Women Act, or also known as VAWA. It is my privilege to hand it over to our first presenter, Gordon Levine. Gordon. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Gordon Levine. My pronouns are he and him. I am white and Jewish. I am also a, a technical assistance provider with ICF. I'd like to invite my co-presenter, Kristen, to introduce herself at this time. Hi, everyone. My name is Kristen Delcamp. My pronouns are she and her, and I am a grant administrator on the ESGCV grant for California HCD. Very good. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, we're going to go ahead and click over to the next slide, please. Uh, so for those of you in the audience, I know that you've tuned in, you know that this is a Violence Against Women Act webinar, um, but we did want to offer this content warning uh, to folks who may uh, may have wandered in because this was an important series for ESG um, and who might not be aware of the kind of things that we will be discussing today. Um, since we're talking about the Violence Against Women Act, necessarily uh, slides will discuss and touch on domestic violence, um, which includes but isn't limited to subjects such as sexual assault, stalking, dating violence, and other forms of intimate partner violence and victimization. Um, and we do request that everyone in the audience please put yourself on uh, mute so we can make sure everybody can hear each other. Thank you very much. Um, I do want to emphasize that this presentation slides do not contain explicit imagery or language. However, we are aware that this content does need to be, uh, content does not need to be explicit to be triggering. Um, if you need to take a break, if you need to disengage, if you need to request information in a different format, um, please do so in the chat, uh, re-requesting information in a different format. If you need to take a break, just get up and walk around. Um, this, uh, all of this content will be made available afterward, both in PowerPoint and in recording form. Um, so please do come back to you at, at your leisure. We want this to be as accessible as possible, both to folks who are comfortable engaging this subject matter and folks who need to approach it more carefully. Um, thanks for listening on, on that. Uh, let's head to the next slide. So what are we going to do? We've got two halves today. Um, the first half, which is roughly 45 minutes, we're going to talk about what VAWA is and how it intersects with ESG. And the second half, we're going to have a Q&A portion uh, to talk about VAWA. Uh, and then we're going to talk some about uh, VAWA 2022, um, which more formally is known as the uh, 2022 Reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act uh, and the ways in which it impacts every participant and every project engaged in ESG. Next slide, please. So uh, as we uh, have traditionally noted, um, all of this, what we're talking about today affects uh, everyone in the entire ESG grant stream from HUD all the way down to sub-sub-recipients. Um, but this training today is really focused on sub-recipients and sub-sub-recipients in California, um, meaning organizations that receive ESG in a contract directly from HCD or organizations that receive ESG in a contract from one of ESG's sub-recipients. Those folks are also sometimes called uh, sub-grantees or sub-contractors. Next slide, please. So some key vocabulary, uh, ESG is of course the Emergency Solutions Grant Program and ESG CV is ESG funded through the CARES Act. VAWA is the Violence Against Women Act, which is the central or core federal regis legislation uh, related to preventing and responding to domestic violence perpetrated against people regardless of their gender. I know it says women in the title, but it's not about uh, just women, it's about all people. Uh, fiscal year is, of course, the year in which uh, ESG funds are allocated by HUD. Uh, CAHCD refers to the California Department of Housing and Community Development, which is incidentally the largest ESG recipient in California. HUD is the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, which funds ESG. A recipient is an entity that receives ESG directly from HUD, which means, in our case, HCD. We've already discussed subrecipient. Um, and finally, TBRA and PBRA refer uh, respectively to tenant-based and project-based rental assistance, which are two different kinds of subsidies. Tenant-based stays with the participant and travels to any market rate unit. Project-based stays with the unit and participants choose among those PBRA units. Next slide, please. So one key concept, uh, so VAWA and ESG, VAWA is 
a really big piece of legislation. Uh, funds about a billion dollars worth of activities. Um, it touches on lots and lots of different federal departments, which trickles down to even more state and local level entities. Um, the scope of talking about all of VAWA, first of all, we would be here all day. And second of all, some of it, really quite a lot of it, doesn't directly impact ESG. There are parts of VAWA that do impact ESG because they impact lots of stuff. And there are parts of VAWA that impact ESG because they are HUD specific. And there are a couple of parts, I think there's one part, uh, maybe two parts, that specifically impact ESG because it's written into VAWA that it affects the COC program and ESG. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Next slide, please. I think finally for me, applicability, if you take nothing else away from this session, I beg you to hear this from me. VAWA protections apply to all ESG participants. Today's webinar is not about victim services providers or VSPs, organizations that are just dedicated to serving people who are survivors of domestic violence. Today's webinar is about things that every single organization and project receiving or implementing ESG are required to do and must know. VAWA applies across ESG, regardless of whether you intend to or think you are serving people who are survivors of or fleeing domestic violence, VAWA applies to you. So this is about everybody, even though uh, it seems like on the face of it, it might just be about one subpopulation. This is about what everybody who receives ESG does. Next slide, please. On which note, I will turn it over to Kristen for a brief history of VAWA. Thank you very much, Gordon. So we are going to talk in this section about a brief history of VAWA, as well as some definitions um, that you'll want to know uh, as we move through the session. So starting with the brief history, VAWA was originally passed in 1994 and authorized by then Senator Joe Biden. It was the first federal legislation acknowledging domestic violence and sexual assault as crimes and providing federal resources to encourage coordinated community responses to violence against women. VAWA must be renewed every five years. It was most recently renewed in 2022 and more on that later in the presentation. VAWA creates a framework for defining domestic violence. It establishes legal tools to combat domestic violence. It funds services for victims of domestic violence and domestic violence survivors. And it funds a variety of other activities, including violence reduction programs, healthcare system response, and culturally specific activities, most of them outside the scope of this webinar. Most recently, VAWA was reauthorized for 2022. The White House budget request for 2022 was 1 billion, up from 670 million in 2012. Homeless service providers are often most familiar with the 200 million that flows through the Department of Justice and specifically the Office on Violence Against Women or the OVW. VAWA continues to directly impact homeless service providers and ESG recipients and subrecipients. Let's talk a little bit about some definitions. So a key concept is that there are slightly differing definitions um, between OVW and HUD. The OVW definition is often considered the general definition, but other departments have different but overlapping definitions, including HUD. In terms of the OVW's definition, domestic violence is a pattern of abusive behavior in any relationship that is used by one partner to gain or maintain power and control over another intimate partner. Domestic violence can be physical, sexual, emotional, economic, psychological, or technological actions or threats of actions or other patterns of coercive behavior that influence another person with an intimate partner relationship. This includes any behaviors that intimidate, manipulate, humiliate, isolate, frighten, terrorize, coerce, threaten, blame, hurt, injure, or wound someone. DV can happen to anyone regardless of race, age, sexual orientation, religion, sex, or gender identity, socioeconomic background or education level, in same-sex or opposite-sex relationships, and to intimate partners who are married, living together, dating, or share a child. 
DV also affects family members, friends, coworkers, other witnesses, the community at large, and particularly children. Please note that the OVW definition expands on but does not replace the foundational definition in VAWA. Let's move into HUD's definition of domestic violence. VAWA's housing safeguards apply to survivors of domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, and or stalking. Domestic violence includes felony or misdemeanor crimes committed by a current or former spouse or intimate partner of the victim under the family or domestic violence laws of the jurisdiction receiving grant funding and in the case of victim services includes the use or attempted use of physical abuse or sexual abuse or a pattern of any other coercive behavior committed, enabled or solicited to gain or maintain power and control over a victim, including verbal, psychological, economic, or technological abuse that may or may not constitute criminal behavior by a person who is a current or former spouse or intimate partner of the victim or person similarly situated to a spouse of a victim, is cohabitating or has cohabitated with the victim as a spouse or intimate partner, shares a child in common with the victim, or commits acts against a youth or adult victim who is protected from those acts under family or domestic violence laws of the jurisdiction. Dating violence means violence committed by a person who is or has been in a social relationship of a romantic or intimate nature with the victim and where the existence of such a relationship shall be determined based on a consideration of the following factors. Length of relationship, type of relationship, frequency of interaction between people in the relationship. Sexual assault is any non-consensual sexual act prescribed by federal, tribal, or state law, including when the victim lacks capacity to consent. Stalking means engaging in a course of conduct directed at a specific person that would cause a reasonable person to either fear for their safety or the safety of others or suffer substantial emotional distress. Please note the HUD definition focuses on elements of, but does not replace the foundational definition in VAWA. So while the OVW and HUD definitions have much in common, let's look a little bit at how they contrast. The OVW de definition recognizes a broader range of abuse, recognizes a broader range of victims and survivors, and is not exclusively focused on criminal activities. On the other hand, the HUD has a narrow focus. Who qualifies for housing protections? It has tighter definitions and it is exclusively focused on criminal activities. So there are different definitions for different situations as we can see between the OVW and the HUD definitions. And this can require some translation between victim service providers and homeless service providers. And I'm going to turn it over to Gordon for some more detail. All right. Thank you, Kristen. Let's have a look at the next slide. All right. So let's talk about what VAWA requires in ESG. Um, generally speaking, we're going to talk about who covered housing providers are and whether you are one. We'll talk about HMIS comparable databases. We'll talk about the prohibition on eviction and termination on the basis or as a result of DV for housing and a prohibition on eviction or termination on the basis or result of DV for shelters. We'll talk about the notification of occupancy rights under VAWA and the certification form that y'all need to distribute to participants. We'll talk about lease bifurcation, uh, what that means, when it kicks in, what you gotta do. We'll talk about VAWA lease language, which is language that must be included in all ESG leases. And finally, we will talk about the emergency transfer plan uh, that uh, all of you are required to know about, um, and that nevertheless, many uh, COCs, ESG recipients, ESG subrecipients, and providers uh, do not yet know about or have their arms around. So it's going to be an exciting uh, section in here. Next slide, please. So a covered, a covered housing provider, or a CHP, uh, is an entity that meets any of the following criteria. And you will notice that this is like everybody who does anything for a participant at any point in any of their service. For the purposes of an emergency transfer plan requirement, again, we'll talk about that later, uh, any uh, CHP is anyone who administers rental assistance. 
So that would be a, a project that is responsible for uh, channeling rental assistance down to a participant. Um, a CHP with respect to the limitations on VAWA assistance under the relevant section of VAWA, uh, housing owners. So that's uh, people who own property. Um, and I believe it also applies to uh, people who are property managers. Uh, for the purposes of, uh, again, the relevant section of VAWA, which clarifies the circumstances under which a victim of domestic violence may or may not be evicted or have their assistance terminated, uh, it's anybody we just talked about. So it's property owners, property managers, rental assistance administrators, anybody who is responsible for providing housing to a participant uh, or funding housing for a participant. Uh, for the purposes of the relevant section of VAWA that defines uh, the procedures for documenting the occurrence of uh, DV, um, it's, again, anybody we just talked about. Um, note also that HCD or any subrecipient or any sub-subrecipient may limit requests to document the occurrence of DV. Um, there are, uh, there's a section of the ESG interim rule, it's on the slide that talks about when you're required to provide documentation versus when you're allowed to say, meh, we've already done that. Um, it's worth having a read of when you get, it, it, it's worth having a look at just to know kind of what's in there and the distinction. Um, it's more of a reference item than something that you need to know offhand. But the gist of it is that if a participant has already documented uh, the occurrence of domestic violence to you, they don't have to keep doing it. And if a landlord requests documentation, which they are allowed to do so to an extent under 2 CFR 5 2007, um, they're not required to reduplicate documentation. Uh, so the goal is to uh, ultimately avoid re-traumatizing people by requiring them to certify again and again things that they have already certified. Next slide, please. Over to you, Kristen. the trick of unmuting. So let's talk about prohibitions on denial of assistance or admission, termination, or removal. When it comes to emergency shelter, if an applicant or participant would otherwise qualify for admission or occupancy, applicants cannot be denied admission if they are or have been the victim of domestic violence. And applicants cannot be removed from the shelter if they are or have been the victim of domestic violence. In terms of housing regarding rental, re, rental, excuse me, rapid rehousing or homelessness prevention, if an applicant or participant would otherwise qualify for admission or occupancy, they cannot be denied admission if they are or have been the victim of domestic violence. Participants cannot be evicted from their housing solely because they are a victim of domestic violence, and participants cannot have their housing assistance terminated solely because they are a victim of domestic violence. And then I think it's back over to me. Uh, Kristen, if we could go back to that slide real quick, there is something I wanna uplift there um, that's a nuance that I think the slide uh, doesn't capture um, because it's uh, readable rather than in tiny, tiny, tiny print. Um, <clears throat> it talks about uh, are or have been, and are or have been is pretty broad. Um, and both of them, uh, the prospective and the retrospective qualifications are important to get your head around. Are means the thing is happening to them right now, right? They, they are experiencing this thing. It is an emergent occurrence. Uh, and so what that means is, and this is part of why we talk about um, this, this webinar being applicable to everybody, is you may have a participant in your program who you might think for good reasons or uh, for uh, just like not, not, not knowing a thing reason. Um, there are any number of reasons why you might think, you know, they're, they're not only uh, did they come into this project and they had no history of domestic violence, but there's no way they're ever going to experience domestic violence, right? That's just, it's just not going to be a part of their life. So I'm not thinking about it. If they come to you and say, you know, this is what's going on and this isn't my case record, uh, domestic violence really only requires uh, self-certification. There's, no there's no circumstance under which you can require a person to provide third-party documentation of domestic violence. Um, and so if someone comes to you and says, this is what's going on, they are 
the victim of domestic violence, a domestic, a victim of domestic violence, um, for the purposes of all of these protections. That's the prospective or the current or forward-looking version. The retrospective version have been the victim of domestic violence means that if it's anywhere in their history, and you know about it, it means that you can't take action on the basis of domestic violence, on the basis of them having been uh, the victim of domestic violence. And it means in the event that uh, you are in the process of taking action that would be prohibited if they have been, even if you don't know about it, and it comes up and it is an element of the action that you're taking is contingent on the instance of domestic violence, they may well be protected under VAWA from uh, termination or removal. And I'll give you an example of the way in which that might be tricky. So those of you who have been in presentations with me before may know that I was diagnosed with PTSD about 15 years ago. Um, that doesn't really come up much in my day-to-day -day existence. I'm well managed. I'm, uh, you know, I'm I'm healthy and under control, and I see a therapist, and so on and so on and so on. I do the things that you do when you live with a severe and persistent mental illness. Um, but there are times when it is a disabling condition, and if you didn't know that about me, uh, and you were to encounter me having uh, a, an episode uh, or having some of the, the outward effects of a PTSD spasm, is what I prefer to call it, um, you might think, oh, what, what, what's, what's happening there? If that were to happen to me in, if I were, for example, a participant in uh, ESG, if I was receiving ESG housing, and I demonstrated an outward behavior that was a consequence of my mental illness. And there were uh, a law like VAWA to protect me from discrimination on the basis of it, like for example, the Americans with Disabilities Act. And someone were to say, no, nah, we're gonna, this, this housing is not working for you. You know, you're in rapid rehousing, you really need to be in PSH. We're going to remove you from rapid rehousing and then try and get you into PSH. If they didn't know that I had PTSD and that was a result of that, I could step in and say, hey, actually, disability, I'm protected from that. Uh, by analogy, people who uh, are victims of domestic violence have the same protection. If they demonstrate something, a behavior, a circumstance that is the consequence of domestic violence, and a termination or removal decision is, on the ba is based on something that can be directly traced back to that, even if they haven't disclosed that before, they may well be protected by VAWA if they say, hey, actually, that thing that happened, that's about my domestic violence situation. I'm a victim, I'm a survivor. And at that point, the uh, covered housing provider may be prohibited from acting. I know that was a long detour, but it is where the nuance of VAWA lives. So I appreciate you all uh, taking the time uh, to go on that walk with me. I think we can probably go to the next slide. I do also want to say, as questions come up, um, we are going to have an opportunity later in this uh, presentation for Q&A, but if you want to get your questions out there now, um, we may answer them as we go in the flow, but even if we don't, we'll have an opportunity to look at them, read them, and think about them so we can give you a better answer later. So if you're wondering something, just drop it in the chat. We're happy to hear it. Um, you can put it in the general chat or message it directly to me or Kristen. So the notice of occupancy rights under VAWA and the certification form. Um, so each entity responsible for administering rental assistance, which generally speaking means a sub-sub-recipient who runs a rapid or homelessness prevention project, um, is required to provide the following two forms to each ESG applicant and each ESG participant. The forms are linked in the slideshow and you can just Google form HUD 5380 and it'll pop right up. Um, the forms are the notice of occupancy rights under VAWA and the certification of DV. Uh, these are uh, HUD standard forms. You do not need to reinvent the wheel. In fact, I don't think you're allowed to reinvent the wheel. Um, the forms are out there. You just implement them. The forms have to be provided at each of the following times. When an applicant is denied rental assistance, when an applicant's application for a unit receiving PBRA is denied, so that's the first one's really about TBRA, the second one's about e PBRA, um, when a participant begins receiving ESG, when a participant is notified of the termination of ESG, and when a participant receives notice of eviction. 
I must be honest with you, even I, who believe strongly in the VAWA protections, I feel strongly about this issue. I'm excited to be doing this presentation for you all. It's a somber subject, but an important one to me personally. I That's a lot. That's a lot of times to give the same blank forms to participants. I recognize that it's a lot. It is what's required by VAWA. It is what it is. Next slide, please. All right, let's talk for just a minute about uh, lease bifurcation requirements. When a family receiving TBRA separates under the lease bifurcation clause of 24 CFR 5.2009 section A, their TBRA and their utility assistance, if any, must continue for the family members who are not evicted or removed. When a family living in a PBRA unit separates under the lease bifurcation clause of 24 CFR 5.2009 section A, the family members who are not evicted or removed can remain in the PBRA unit without interruption to the unit's rental assistance or utility assistance. All right, VAWA lease language. So this is the one that makes everybody's head explode. Um, so just bear with me. I'm going to talk about what it is, and then I'm going to talk about how you navigate it. The rule is subrecipients are required to ensure that the VAWA lease language requirements under 24 CFR Part 5, blah, 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 are included in all ESG rental lease agreements and leases. The relevant language is, first of all, in the VAWA compliance policy that Christian just dropped in the chat. Second of all, it's in the ESG program, or it's in the it's in uh, the it's in 24 CFR Part Five, which is VAWA, which is uh, included by uh, reference in the ESG interim rule. The lease language is a medium length way of saying that if a participant experiences domestic violence, uh, they can't be evicted as a result. They can't have their their assistance terminated as a result. Um, and they are ultimately empowered to uh, cancel the lease if they need to do so for the purposes of, or they can break the lease for the purposes of uh, moving to safe permanent housing or to another safe location, rather, um, which is a, which is a lot, right? It's a lot for landlords. Um, it's a lot for everybody to digest, really. Um, there is a sample VAWA lease amendment, so we'll uh, we'll get there a sec. Uh, Kristen um, just dropped the VAWA lease amendment in the chat. In the event that a landlord provides a lease that includes all of the protections in VAWA, you do not need to take any further action. However, and it's incidentally, I should say that it is possible California lease language does require most or all of what is in VAWA. Um, I apologize. I intended to have that reviewed and to have a good answer for you. I am not a lawyer. I would strongly encourage you to do your own research on this um, and speak with your own in-house counsel uh, in the event that you believe that a lease might or might not cover it. But to be safe, the VAWA lease amendment is right there. Under most circumstances, you have to attach an amendment that includes the necessary language. You've got three options. HUD has a sample lease amend addendum, which is form HUD, blah, blah, blah. You can Google it, it's out there. It's a good base. It does include everything that is required. Um, it was written kind of a long time ago at this point. Um, and my general perspective is that it can be improved upon by people who uh, want it to be clearer or um, more uh, adapted to their program. HCD has a VAWA lease addendum, which is based on uh, of the relevant form from HUD, uh, which can be adopted by any subrecipient or sub subrecipient without modification and put immediately into practice. Finally, you may develop your own lease amendment based on the relevant HUD form if you really want to. I would advise going with option number two, if it were me. Um, because it requires no effort, because it meets the standard, and because at the end of the day, um, anything that you put additionally into that lease addendum as a subrecipient uh, is yet one more thing that you need to convince a landlord is going to be okay for them. 
regardless of which option you pick, you have to define your approach to VAWA lease language in written standards or project policies and procedures, which means either the subrecipient, the organization receiving money directly from HCD, has to define it in their written standards, or if the subrecipient doesn't, each of their sub sub recipients have to define what they're doing about this lease addendum and their project policies and procedures. I will say up front that one of the major concerns with the VAWA lease amendment and the VAWA lease language is that landlords don't like it like additional stuff being tucked into their leases. Um, at the best best case scenario, it's just one more thing, right? But there are landlords who will be scared off by uh, the protections that VAWA gives people because it is more complexity for their business. And as we know, there are landlords who are skittish about uh, accepting government assistance. There are landlords who are skittish about providing housing to someone who is in a homeless assistance program. There are landlords who are skittish about everything that isn't just like the quietest person on earth moving into their unit and paying their rent five days in advance. And everything that takes a, a prospective tenant further from this like hypothetical non-person um, who is silently paying rent always on time uh, is something that could scare a landlord off. The reality is this is, uh, this is the law. It must be included in every single lease. Every single ESG subsidized lease has to have this language. There is no way around it. You've got to put it in there. In terms of selling this to landlords, I think what I would emphasize is at the end of the day, it is exceedingly rare for this clause to be triggered. It does happen. It's unusual. It is uh, not just the exception, but it is, it is rare in my experience um, that it's triggered for a lot of different reasons. Um, you know, I I am I, I I wouldn't say that I am a an expert on DV provision. I've never worked for a victim services provider. I'm sure we have many on the call today who can speak to it better than I would. Um, but some of it is about housing security. Some of it is about wanting to stay in the place that you are. Um, some of it is about familiarity. Some of it is about about about. At the end of the day, these provisions are incredibly important. They're an important protection for people who need them, and they're rarely triggered. And I think that that's worth highlighting, is that this is a fallback that is just rarely used. Um, I think it probably could do to be used more often. But part of the way you can talk to landlords about it is that it's, it's simply an uncommon provision to activate, uh, and that the intention is that the participants stay there for the duration of the lease. Next slide, please. Okay, let's uh, move into discussing emergency transfer plan requirements. Uh, Subrecipients that administer rental assistance must develop and implement an ETP. The purpose of the ETP is to enable participants who are victims of domestic violence to transfer from an existing unit to another safe unit without an interruption in their ESG assistance. This is um, an important topic and we're going to go into more detail uh, on this. I'll pass it to you, Gordon. Okay, so the emergency transfer plan, this is the uh, this is the other big uh, VAWA protection in ESG that it, the reality is many folks just don't know about. They don't know that there's a requirement to have one. If there is one, they don't know what's in it. If they If they know what's in it, they don't know how to activate it. The emergency transfer plan, in a nutshell, Every subrecipient has to have one. The goal of the emergency transfer plan is to ensure that if a participant comes to you and says, hi, I am experiencing domestic violence. I, I, I'm experiencing sexual assault in my unit right now, or I am, I am a DV victim and I have a reasonable belief, I have a reasonable belief that there's a threat of imminent harm from further violence if I stay here. The emergency transfer plan provides a kind of tiered list of options for them to say, or rather to insist that they uh, be afforded another unit that they consider safe 
uh, within a reasonable period of time, which might be immediately, or if immediately is not possible, might be as soon as possible, either within the program or outside the project, either within the service area or outside the service area. So uh, the emergency transfer plan is triggered when a, first of all, the participant has to request it. So they gotta know about it. So they should be informed that, that this transfer plan exists. Be a good, part, good thing to include in your uh, intro packet um, that you distribute to participants. Um, you know, project rules and uh, when you're going to meet with your case manager and the housing assistance payment contract. Oh, and here's the emergency transfer plan brief. You don't have to give them the whole transfer plan, but you do need to let them know that it exists. So they have to request it. And then either, as I said, they either A, have to reasonably believe, and they will they certify that, um, that there is a threat of imminent harm from further violence if they stay in that current housing, or if they're the victim of sexual assault, uh, on, uh, either at any point leading up to that, or uh, on the premises of their unit within the 90-day calendar period preceding the date of their ETP request. So the the upshot of that second provision is that if a person is the victim of a sexual assault uh, on the premises of their subsidized unit, within the next 90 calendar days, they can trigger the emergency transfer plan. Um, and that's the only timing consideration there. Once it's triggered, it's triggered. The uh, provider has to go through with it. For families receiving TBRA, so that's scattered site rental assistance, rental assistance that travels with the participant, they have to specify what will happen. The I'm sorry, the provider must specify what's going to happen regarding the non-transferring family members, uh, if any. Um, and so that's the lease bifurcation piece. Um, and this is tricky because you have to make a decision. You know, this is this can be tricky. Um, there are cases in which domestic violence occurs and the entire family moves. And at that point, you're just moving a family with their TBRA. That's fairly straightforward. If the instance of domestic violence is between members of the same household, you have two problems really, or two challenges. One is you need to provide a safe housing option for uh, the elements of the family who are um, victims. And that could be uh, that could be adults, that could be children, that could be a combination, um, that could be many people, that could be one person. So you need to provide safe housing for them in a new unit. Then you've got the rest of the household to deal with. And this can be morally a little complex, and it could be programmatically challenging. Because in that situation, the remainder of the household, at least some members of the remainder of the household, probably all the remainder of the household, are on the perpetrating side of domestic violence. And there is absolutely a, a moral sense for many providers that like, of course, we'll keep the TBRA with the folks who are moving, and we're gonna kick the folks who perpetrated the domestic violence out. But ESG is a homelessness prevention program. And as a good general rule, HUD never wants you to make any, never wants you to put a person in a situation where they return to homelessness if there is another option available. And the reality is that it is often the right thing programmatically when you bifurcate a household in which you are talking about both the perpetrators and victims of domestic violence to say, okay, we now have two households and we need to find a way to serve both of them, one in the existing unit, or if they want to transfer to a new unit, if we want to afford them that right, and the household that moved to safe housing, we need to serve both of them because the alternative is that you are moving the TBRA with the initial household, the moving household, and you are uh, cutting a subsidy out from the household that's remaining or the family members that are remaining on the basis of domestic, uh, on the basis that they were the perpetrators of domestic violence. I'm not saying any of that is easy. You should have a process for that defined in your policies and procedures. Um, 
again, this is a good area to consult with your, uh, your legal counsel um, regarding what you are required to do under state law and under VAWA because it is complex. There is also the there there are, are also budgetary concerns, right? Because if you are creating two households, you now have to deal with two subsidies in case management for two households and so on. It's complex. There's there's not an easy or direct answer to it. And it is a place where you're going to want to talk to your lawyer. Um, it's a place that requires thought. Uh, it's also a good place to talk to your local victim services providers and your statewide DV coalition. So um, that's worth dwelling on because the really what you don't want to have happen is for this situation to occur and for you to not know what to do or have a policy in place for what you're going to do. Rulemaking on the fly is not good. Rulemaking on the fly when it comes to whether you're going to house people is really sticky. For families that are not receiving for, for families that are receiving PBRA, not TBRA, uh, there's a third thing, but it's families that are not receiving TBRA. Um, for uh, folks who are fleeing, that's ETP qualifying participants, if a safe unit isn't immediately available, um, they have to have priority over all other applicants for ESG housing. This is also complicated. There's a relevant section in the ESG program interim rule. Generally speaking, you want to make sure that this is tied in with your local coordinated entry system so that your local coordinated entry system has something that says anybody who uh, has qualified for an ETP is at the top of our prioritization list, period. And generally, that takes care of both COC and ESG's VAWA requirements. Um, also really helps on the, uh, the moving folks to safe housing piece. Uh, it just makes the, the entire implementation process go faster. <clears throat> um, so there's a really good question in the chat, and I want to pick it up right now because it is relevant to what we're talking about. So Tammy asks, what if one household member reports domestic violence, but the other household member says there was no DV in the household? Um, moments like these, I really wish we were in person because uh, I would ask, I, 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 there's part of me that will always be a second grade teacher, despite having never been a second grade teacher, because what I would say is, okay, who thinks, who thinks what? Somebody tell me what you think would do. We're not in that format right now, so I'll just tell you, uh, DV never requires third party verification. Put a different way. If somebody says, I was the victim of domestic violence. You have to believe them, period. The certification form that we mentioned several slides ago, you can require them to fill out that certification form for sure. That's what that's for. Um, but once that's filled out and signed, you have to uh, uh, accept that regardless of your personal beliefs, regardless of conflicting testimony from other people, once someone certifies that they are the victim of domestic violence, that certification is, uh, is, is the document of record and there's, there, you can't contradict it. And so um, in that situation, if you've got uh, two people living in a household, one of them says, hi, I'm the victim of domestic violence. I need safe housing and a transfer. The other person says, nothing happened here. You say, okay, person A, we're going to engage the emergency transfer plan uh, process with you. And that's the end of it. Now, for person B, again, there's the question of what you're going to do in terms of their housing. But in terms of uh, person B having the right to say, hey, that's not true. Person A is wrong. Person B has no right. Um, they have no uh, standing to um, countermand the DB certification. I, and Tammy, I hope that was uh, uh, clear, direct, and comprehensive enough. Uh, you're very welcome. Next slide, please. Other ETP requirements. Has to incorporate priority prioritization info in relation to other housing applicants. Again, best practice, integrate this with your coordinated entry system. It has to have confidentiality provisions um, that are designed to ensure that uh, the location information of people fleeing domestic violence is not released. Um, it has to allow participants to make an internal transfer when a safe unit is immediately available. So for example, if you've got a unit and in your project already that's been ID'd, uh, you have to afford the person who is fleeing the opportunity to move into it immediately. 
immediately is a word that we're saying a lot here. It's because DV is immediate. If someone needs safe housing, they need it now, they don't need it later. Um, it has to have provisions for internal transfers if a safe unit is not immediately available. So what are you going to do if you can't get somebody out of there right away? How are you going to ensure that they are safe? Um, and finally, it has to describe reasonable efforts that you will take when a safe unit is not immediately available, including external transfers. Um, there are more details about that in BAWA and the relevant section, um, but external transfer broadly means transfer to another project or another geography, and you need to have a plan for how you do that. Next slide, please. ETPs may require participant documentation, provided that all of the following are true. A, the participant's written request is sufficient to trigger the ETP. Um, B, that uh, you may ask participants to document the occurrence of domestic violence in accordance with the relevant section of VAWA if the participant has not already provided documentation. Reminder, this is about like not making people certify things twice. And if they've already certified it once, the landlord can't demand second certification. And finally, C, no other documentation is required to qualify under the ETP. Yet the participant has to request it in accordance with the ETP, and they may be asked to document it uh, in accordance with the VAWA certification. And that's it, it happens once. Uh, CHP is cited there because landlords and property owners are also involved there. That's the may ask participants to document. Landlords do have the right to ask for that, but they don't have the ask. They don't have the right to perpetually ask or to ask to recertify. Um, the ETP in its entirety must be made available upon request and when feasible must be publicly available. This is a good one to have posted on like your website or uh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of all sorts of different program configurations, but many projects and programs uh, keep their uh, participant policies like pen to a clipboard on the wall. This is a good clipboard item too. Finally, covered housing providers. Incidentally, this also means landlords must keep records of ETP requests and the outcomes of those requests. Uh, so what this means from realistically from an ESG subrecipient perspective, what it means is if somebody asks for an ETP uh, an, an ETP response. Regardless of what happens, you have to document the entire thing and keep it for the duration of a normal ESG record. Um, my advice, it could go in the participant file. That's a good place to put it. But you should at least consider also keeping a separate log of all ETP requests and outcomes. Could just be copies of what's in the participant file, but keep it in a centralized place. Because as we're going to discuss later, HUD as part of VAWA 22, uh, 2022, um, is looking at uh, monitoring and enforcement of VAWA provisions. And I guarantee you one of the things they're going to be looking at is records of ETP requests. Having it all in one place is going to save you a gigantic headache come March 2024. Next slide. Okay. Last thing from me for a little bit, I think. ETP applicability. All subrecipients, every organization that receives money, ESG funds, from HCD, every organization that is a direct recipient of money, ESG, from HCD, must have an ETP, an emergency transfer plan. You have to write one. And... ETP protects all ESG participants, as we said, not just victim services provider participants. This is, again, it's for everybody, and every subrecipient has to have one of these plans. There is a sample plan out there. I think it's hosted still by the National Network to End Domestic Violence. I will say, as someone who uh, has worked on that plan to some extent, um, it's bare bones. Right, it hits all of the the requirements. Um, in it hits all of the requirements in VAWA 2018, 2017, the last reauthorization. Um, but it's pretty bare bones. It's not customized, and you will always have local nuances that the uh, template does not provide. So I would strongly encourage you, if you receive money directly from HCD ESG funding. 
look up the template ETP and start thinking about how to adapt that to work for your projects. And when I say your projects, I mean anybody who gets rapid in HP that you sub fund, including your own projects and other organizations. I see a question. Um, are you able to provide a link to the template? Yes, the next time I'm off camera, I will go hunt that up. Um, it is a quick Google search. I will find it for you. Next slide, please. OK. Q&A. Uh, so this is, we're going to do Q&A on anything that we have talked about so far. Um, normally, Q&A is the last thing that we present on. It is not the last thing. It is the last part of part one of this two-part, uh, uh, two-section presentation. I encourage you to stay after. We're going to talk about uh, VAWA 2022 and HCD's exploration of providing public comment in relation to it. So. Does anybody have any questions or discussion or concerns or anything about any of the stuff we just presented? Recognizing uh, both that we are being recorded, so of course this will be posted later, um, but that these are challenging from uh, potentially emotionally challenging topics, but they're also really, really programmatically challenging if you haven't been in a place where you're thinking about uh, protections for people fleeing domestic violence or people who are victims of sexual assault. So any questions on any of that? I'm always a little nervous when nobody asks questions because it, it, really either we did an incredible job with the material and I'm never sure that that is the case or there's somebody out there who wonders something and isn't asking and that makes me nervous. I'm comfortable not having done the best job in the universe presenting, which I didn't. Nobody ever does. But I'm concerned there might be somebody out there with a question. I see a hand up. Feel free to drop it in the chat or come off mute. Good morning. This is Veronica Wilson with Mendocino County. Um, first, just thanks so much for this presentation. It's great. Um, I'm So just to kind of lay it out a little bit. We are with the county of Mendocino, and we operate um, a sponsor-based rental assistance program um, through our Project Home Key for select um, persons who, um, who enter and are literally homeless <clears throat> and um, don't have any form of rental assistance to you know, pay the rent and things like that. Um, this is a mixed use site. So we've got other funding sources that pay for, you know, and so it's not just the um, sponsor based rental assistance. My question is if one of our, like CalWork family, not in ESG at all, if they experience domestic violence, would these kind of protections for the, like the perpetrator to find them alternative housing? Um, or the alleged perpetrator, excuse me. Would that apply if it's not an ESG client participant, but they're in a facility that other people do? That is the best VAWA question I think I've ever received. Um, interesting, <laughs> and no, it's it's interesting. And I don't really have a great definitive answer for you. So let me echo that back to you to make sure that I understand the question. Um, okay. The question is, you've got a facility where people are receiving sponsor-based uh, rental assistance. That's the third kind of housing that I was talking about. Some of whom are ESG subsidized and some of whom are not ESG subsidized. Correct. And the question is, since the since some of the units, but not all of them, are receiving an ESG subsidy, uh, do the ESG VAWA protections apply to the non-ESG subsidized units? Do I have that right? You got it. You got it. Okay, that's such a cool question, um, and it's cool, <laughs> it, it's it's a cool question because it gets into um, how far does e, what is what what is uh, what is under the ESG umbrella when ESG touches a facility? So um, project room key. So we're talking about like a hotel or motel style complex that's been converted into housing, right? So this is a 
entire project home key home and key. it was a motel but it is permanent housing that's why we have it as a sponsor based sure. rapid you know, rapid rehousing sure i'm just trying to get a sense of like what facility yeah. means right so yeah. that's i've got so I've, it's, everybody has their own rental agreement or lease so got it that helps a with lot support, but yeah and it comes with optional support but it's not a psh site it's a little different got it and the facility itself so mm -hmm. um so you let's say there's 30 units there 15 are esg subsidized 15 are not esg subsidized does the facility okay. itself have any esg money associated with running the facility is are the grounds up kept? I don't that eligibility on that's a little bit. Yeah. Um, at, so are, at, at furniture, only, equipment, utilities, anything is anything right. that is facility level ESG subsidized. So there are two things that are ESG EV subsidized. One is the rental assistance that I mentioned already, that's mm -hmm. paid directly to. Um, our property management company that operates it and does all the paperwork and, you know, so kind of takes care of that conflict of interest. Mm -hmm. So we pay it directly to them. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also have two on-site, um, like case managers, property, mm -hmm. like that they assist with on-site services. Um, mm -hmm. And some of their time is paid by ESG CV rapid rehousing, but mm -hmm. not, it's like maybe half at the most. Mm -hmm. it, so I was right. This was interesting. Um, so I th so <laughs> the answer is probably not, but I don't want to guarantee that. And so here's what I am okay. thinking about. ESG, if you if you put this in a different way, imagine that there is just like an apartment building out there in the universe, right? And you for yeah. whatever reason happen to rent 15 units there. And uh, as it turns out, that apartment building um, also happens to have some spare office space on site. And mm -hmm. they've and and you're like, that's great. There's office space on site. How cool is that? And they want that you know, for whatever reason, the other half of the uh, folks living in that site are also in need of some level of supportive services. And you're like, okay, we'll, we'll pick up. 50% of the time of the office space and 50% of the uh, case managers using the office space to do ESG case management. And you have absolutely no knowledge of the other 50%. In that situation, it seems to me that the, e the ESG viable protections would not apply to the folks who do not have any ESG rental assistance subsidy and who do not have any supportive services being provided by ESG. They're not enrolled in ESG. ESG is not touching them. Where it gets nope. tricky a little bit is the the you the the fuzziness that I am potentially sensing in terms of like how the folks who are on site are paid because if in theory mm -hmm. they could be providing ESG services to the folks who are not currently receiving ESG services so if like half their time is paid for by ESG but like sometimes they're nipping over to provide services to like that other half of the folks in theory, first of all, those other folks should be enrolled in ESG in an ESG program in HMIS. Um, but right. second, but they weren't um, literally homeless when they came in, and indeed. so they weren't eligible. Mm, good. Uh, and so, so we couldn't we couldn't serve them with that. And and they they do a really good job of documenting like if I'm in they're in an activity and like it's all families, but maybe one or two ESG people come in. Like they only put like maybe a quarter of their time. Like the like they're really good about you know I only worked with them a little bit, but I worked with all the CalWork families today. Got it. You know so so they they I know no ESG funds are being used to support services or any of anything that the non ESG participants like none of it. They're really good about that. They have all right. Well, I, I must say, it seems like you have cr uh, uh, crossed your eyes and dotted your T's um, as- uh, With a lot of help. Yeah, with a lot of help. Um, 
it seems like you have done a really good job of ensuring that you have um, sectioned off your ESG and non-ESG participants' residents. In that case, yeah. no, you have no obligation or you should not have any obligation to afford protections under ESG to people who are definitively not in any way receiving any benefit from ESG. Okay. It is Great. entirely, Thank I you. will say, I don't know, yes. you know, we've talked about 15 yes, 15 no. If the no folks are receiving assistance from a different HUD funding source, right? there are, uh, you know, this is an ESG webinar, we're focused on ESG, but if it's a different funding source under HUD, they may well have similar or identical protections. So that was- Okay, that, would be the that is good to know because we may have some um, SSVF paid um, yep. veteran provider. So um, it's good to know that as well, because I mean, it is mixed use. There's yep. a lot of state though. All the families mostly are through the state programs. That makes sense. I would encourage you to get with your SSVF program manager. I am not an SSVF okay. expert, but I do know that they right. have many of the same program model requirements and considerations that ESG does. So I would get with your SSVF person um, to find out more. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much for your help. That's a great answer. Oh, thank you for your great question. I really appreciate it. I'm glad we could help. Yeah. And then I see another question. I see Mr. Chris Pitcher off mute. I was just going to read the question to you from Vanessa. Oh, no, Our please. Protections assessed if a victim receiving assistance also commits violence towards the other individual. So if I understand the question correctly, uh, what do we do? What protections apply when you have a person who is both the perpetrator of domestic violence and a victim of domestic violence? Gosh. Um, You know, it's a hard it's it's a hard question. It's it's an easy question and a hard question, right? Um, the hard part is there's the moral component, and there's the we're in the serving and helping people business, and the there's an inherent for many people ickiness about like, you know, there are limited benefits to go around, and so we're going to afford those benefits to people who are perpetrating crimes that we find um, morally painful, right? So there's that sort of, you know, you got to get over it emotional ickiness factor. Um, but when it comes right down to it, programmatically, the answer is pretty simple. Um, people who are victims of domestic violence are afforded protections. Perpetrators of domestic violence are not addressed under this at all. VAWA, VAWA 22, as it applies to ESG, doesn't talk about you, you're you're not law enforcement, right? It's not your it's not your job, uh, it's not your role, it's not your responsibility, and it's not your right to say you know as a result of you committing domestic violence, you are not worthy of receiving ESG assistance. You know we provide assistance to uh, people who are uh, exiting the criminal institutions, uh, local criminal institutions. Um, we provide people assistance to people who are on the sex offender, uh, offender registry. The immediacy of it has this extra emotional ick sometimes, and I get that. But at the end of the day, ESG just isn't set up both because it's not set up to do so and because it's not really supposed to have consequences for acting badly, which is really what we're talking about, right? Consequences for doing a thing that we don't like. And we have really good reasons for not liking it. And so in that situation, if you have two people, so earlier somebody asked, you know, what do I do if we've got a two person household and person A says I'm the victim of domestic violence from person B and person B says, I didn't do that. The answer is you serve person A, they're a victim of domestic violence. In this situation, imagine that you've got a household where person A says person B did this, and person B said person A did this. Okay, you have two survivors of domestic violence who need safe housing away from each other. So you get them safe housing away from each other. One of them might stay in the unit. One of them, one of them might stay in the unit. Neither of them might stay in the unit. 
It's going to depend on the circumstances and it's going to depend on your policies and procedures. But at the end of the day, you serve people who are victims and people who are responsible for committing acts of domestic violence, which generally speaking are crimes. You don't worry about the judgment and punishment part. Now, that being said, there may be additional liabilities for reporting in your jurisdiction uh, in terms of observance of a crime, and I'm not going to touch that. Um, that's a legal question. It's way outside our scope. Um, but from an ESG perspective, you provide housing, safe housing, as quickly as possible for victims of domestic violence, regardless of whatever else is going on in their life. Good question, really good question, and unfortunately more common than you might think. Other questions? <clears throat> All right, well, I won't uh, drag it out of you. Those were two really good questions. There's several really good questions. Um, I'm gonna bump us on to the uh, back, back nine of our presentation. Uh, request for public comment on HUD's VAWA 22 implementation. Kristen, you're up. Thank you. All right, so a little bit of background. HUD released an overview of how VAWA 2022 impacts HUD programs on January 4th of this year. HUD has requested public comment on the overview by March 6th, 2023, and California HCD is exploring submitting a public comment on behalf of the state of California. As part of that, California HCD would like to include feedback from ESG recipients and subrecipients in its comments. So a little bit of a disclaimer before we jump into what, um, what the comments are, are surrounding and what the changes are. Um, the following slides are only a summary of HUD's overview of applicability. Language has been condensed and many sections excluded to ensure this presentation succinctly presents the most relevant information. Please review the full overview for HUD's complete statement. On the last slide of this presentation, we'll be including not only the link um, to the survey, but also the link to the full overview uh, for your review. Gordon, you wanna to talk to us a little bit about what we are seeing there? <clears throat> I would be delighted to, and I'm off video, sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> So uh, really we're gonna be hitting on four elements of, of this uh, proposed implementation. Um, there are many other elements. These are the four we're gonna talk about because they most directly impact you. So one of them is the definition of domestic violence. VAWA 2022 expands the definition of domestic violence to include any felony or misdemeanor committed in the local jurisdiction under family or DV law, the use or attempted use of physical or sexual abuse, and any other pattern or course of behavior um, that is extremely broad reaching, regardless of whether it's criminal, by any of several parties, including an extremely broad definition of current and former intimate partners. Generally speaking, what it means is any course of behavior, criminal or otherwise, uh, that is intended to gain power or control over a victim committed by anybody close to the victim. Um, the definition is a little bit more specific than that, but it's it's a it's a broad definition. HUD's implementation of this. HUD proposes that given its broad and inclusive definition of DV and associated terms that currently exists today before VAWA 2022, HUD believes the specific acts that VAWA 2022 has incorporated into its DV definition can reasonably be interpreted to be covered by HUD's existing VAWA regulations. Upshot. ESG recipients, subrecipients, and sub subrecipients are advised to apply HUD's VAWA requirements in a manner that encompasses the definition that we just provided that exists in VAWA 2022. In other words, Category 4 and the definition of domestic violence should incorporate everything on the left side of the slide and in the relevant part of the overview. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so compliance reviews. Uh, this is a lot. Um, but what it boils down to is uh, it requires HUD to actually monitor that folks are implementing VAWA um, and the requirements of VAWA that apply to HUD, uh, and that those, um, those reviews have to start no later than March 15th, 2024. Pretty long runway, but it's no later than may begin earlier than. 
HUD's committed to implementing the changes as specified. Um, it's going to HUD intends to put out detailed reporting requirements on emergency transfer plans and corrective action. Uh, sorry, detailed reporting requirements on emergency transfers and standards for corrective action plans. To the extent possible, it's going to incorporate that into the existing compl compliance review process. For ESG, this is probably HUD's existing ESG monitoring process. It will just have an expanded BALA section. Whatever standards it adopts, HCD and subrecipients will likely need to adopt similar or identical standards to ensure compliance. So expect more from HUD on that. Um, no details at this time. Next slide, please. Third, there's a prohibition against retaliation and coercion. Um, I have to admit that it is not clear to me from HUD's overview whether or not this applies to ESG or not. But I've included it here because there is an element, there's an element of it that suggests that it is us, right? That it's ESG. So there's a prohibition that neither PHAs or property owners or managers of housing that is assisted under a covered housing program, and I think covered housing program does mean ESG, to retaliate against a person because that person has opposed any act or practice made unlawful by the housing title of VAWA or because that person testified, assisted, or participated in any related matter. In other words, PHAs and property managers can't retaliate against ESG participants for speaking up or acting against domestic violence. In addition, there's a prohibition against members of that same group, PHAs, property owners, managers, from coercing, intimidating, threatening, interfering with, or retaliating against any person who exercises or encourages someone to exercise their rights under the housing title of VAWA. In other words, you, uh, if you are an ESG, actually, it's not specific to ESG. I misspoke. I apologize. Um, <clears throat> any of the people specified uh, cannot take action against a person for exercising their rights under VAWA, the housing rights under VAWA specifically. <clears throat> there is a, a, requ a requirement to enforce those prohibitions consistently with the Civil Rights Act. Um, I must be honest with you, I am not a Civil Rights Act expert. I am not entirely sure what that is intended to either include or preclude, but the text, qua text, seems pretty straightforward to me. In terms of HUD's implementation, broadly, HUD believes the Office of Fair Housing Equal Opportunity has the existing rulemaking authority to implement this. Um, via its complaint process, so you can expect that to be the vehicle for this. Um, HUD does plan to issue guidance to help folks understand this process, both folks who might be making complaints and recipients such as PHAs and presumably ESG recipients to figure out what they are required or not required to do. Um, the upshot, however, is that PHAs, owners, and managers of housing assisted under VAWA 22 covered housing programs, again, I think this does mean ESG, should ensure that your policies and procedures include the statutory non-retaliation requirement and prohibition on coercion. It's written in VAWA. What it means is you need to update your PNPs to reflect that language. You should be able to take the language straight out of the thing, um, but you can expect more on that, including details on implementation and enforcement. My general impression, especially since this is a proposed response, is that there is no immediate action required, uh, certainly not until HUD um, approves its overview of implementation and begins to put out uh, guidance on what to do. Um, but do be aware that those updates will be coming. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Finally, uh, there is an update to the McKinney-Vento definition of homelessness. This is probably the most impactful portion of VAWA 2022 on ESG. It is extremely clear that this is intended it, it, this is, I mean, it's an update to the McKinney-Vento definition of homelessness. So this impacts ESG directly, but McKinney-Vento is what funds ESG. It also funds COC program and a bunch of other homelessness assistance. HUD must consider homeless any person who meets, person or family who meets all of the following criteria. They are experiencing trauma or a lack of safety related to or are fleeing or attempting to flee domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, stalking, 
or other dangerous, traumatic, or life-threatening conditions related to the violence against the person in question or a family member in their current housing situation, including where the health and safety of children are jeopardized. And they have no other safe residence and they lack the resources to obtain safe permanent housing. This is the new category four definition, um, or it will be the new category four definition. And we'll talk about what that means in a second. But this is, I would imagine, uh, will be an update to the hearth definition of homelessness. And this will take the place of the current category four definition, which is more circumspect than this and does not include experiencing trauma and this other dangerous, traumatic, or life-threatening conditions language, which is if you are uh, familiar with and spend a lot of time thinking about category four, that's a very expansive definition. HUD's response is that it needs to engage in rulemaking uh, to uh, require ESG recipients, subrecipients, COCs, and COC subrecipients and recipients to make corresponding changes to their written standards and PMPs. Put in a different way, this definition is not live. HUD cannot make this live without going through the rulemaking process, which is a which is serious. That's not a, a memo. That's like the interim rule. That's that level of rulemaking. Caveat to that, ESG and COC recipients and subrecipients and COCs may implement this new definition. You may choose to implement this new definition because this new definition is law. It is in VAWA 2022, it is law. You may choose to implement the new definition before HUD does any of its rulemaking provided that the relevant ESG recipients and COCs update the relevant written standards and PMPs to reflect the new definition. So it is within HCD's authority, and incidentally, it is within all of your COC's authority on the COC side, to say we are adopting this new definition in advance of rulemaking, and this is the category four definition now. Until that happens, you should continue using the existing category four definition. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a duplicate slide, I apologize. Next slide, please. This one too. There we go. <laughs> uh, over to you, Kristen, to take us home. Sure, thank you. Um, so this is coming to the section where we're going to ask you all um, if you're so moved to please provide public comments to California HCD. So again, California HCD is exploring providing public comments to HUD's Violence Against Women Act Reauthorization Act of 2022, overview of applicability to HUD programs. By February 9th, please review the overview and provide any public comments through the uh, anonymous online survey form. Again, a couple of things, February 9th is the deadline um, to provide public comment um, for the California HCD comments. Uh, and the survey form is anonymous. So in terms of what you need to make comments, this is the first link is for the Violence Against Women Act Reauthorization Act of 2022, and it's the overview of applicability to HUD programs. So this is the one to read in full um, before making comment. And then secondly, we have the link, which is the California HCD public comment anonymous online survey form. A reminder that the responses are due by February 9th, 2023. Uh, and uh, these links are going to be sent out to you. I think that they might also be being dropped in the chat, but they're also um, being sent out to all of you uh, when we send out the follow-up email this uh, later today um, for the session. So looks like we got the links in the chat there. And let's see. It looks like there is a question. Um, Gordon, do you want to take that question? I do. Um, and I do want to clarify when we say that the survey form is anonymous, <clears throat> excuse me, I am losing my voice. Uh, we mean both that it is anonymous to HCD. Uh, it is not collecting any information about you. So unless you volunteer your name, your location, your GPS coordinates, something like that, uh, no one will know who the comment came from. In addition to which, 
because of that, uh, comment will be provided anonymously to HUD if comment is provided because there's there will be no uh, non-anonymized information that HCD has. So there was a question in the chat. Tuesday asks, does this drop the literally homeless portion of the homeless uh, definition? Does a person fleeing DV have to be sleeping someplace not meant for human habitation? Um, this question, I think, is related to uh, rapid rehousing. And so if I were to frame it differently, I think the question is, does this mean that a person who meets the BAWA 2022 definition of fleeing domestic violence qualify for ESG-funded rapid rehousing absent also qualifying under category one, which is the literal homelessness, the literally homeless definition. I am not a lawyer. I'm not HUD. And HUD has said that it has to engage in rulemaking before it puts out an updated implementation of the updated definition of domestic violence. There is no indication start that sentence from a different place. Fundamentally, HUD is talking about uh, its category four definition, not its ESG definite ESG participant enrollment requirements. And so HUD has not said that it intends or is looking at or is thinking about modifying the participant eligibility requirements for ESG rapid rehousing to uh, remove the requirement that someone who qualifies under category four must also qualify under category one. No one has said that to the best of my knowledge and no one's implied it to the best of my knowledge. And there's nothing in the overview that suggests it to the best of my knowledge. Fundamentally what they're talking about, what HUD is talking about is updating their uh, category four definition effectively, uh, I think, um, not their rapid rehousing eligibility definition. So I have two responses to that. One of them is there's no indication that that's what's occurring. And so I would strongly advise against assuming that that is what's happening and encourage you in the strongest possible terms, absent additional information, to continue assuming that ESG rapid rehousing requires people to be experiencing literal homelessness before enrolling them. However, uh, if you would like clarification on that, this is a very appropriate moment to submit a, an AAQ question to the HUD Exchange Ask a Question Desk under ESG to say, hey, there's this element of HUD's overview of the applicability of, HUD, of VAWA 2022, and we're wondering if this might impact or if this should impact uh, how we consider category four eligibility under rapid rehousing. Are, they, you know, are you looking at, are you considering, should we remove, should we do differently? I imagine the response that you receive will be HUD has no plans at this time to change ESG rapid eligibility. And if that were to occur, you would receive notice of it via XYZ. But it is a good question. My advice is for now, assume that that is not the intent because there's no indication that that is the intent and continue to proceed under the assumption that to enter ESG rapid, you must be experiencing literal homelessness in addition to fleeing domestic violence if you were fleeing domestic violence. It's a long walk for a short drink, but um, it's, a, it's a good question um, and one I wanted to make sure that uh, everybody had the full scope of context for. Anybody else have any questions about the VAWA 2022 overview or anything else we've said here today? All right, well, I'm all talked out and I think everybody deserves a Friday refund. Uh, it's 12.25 here, 10.25 there. Chris Pitcher, you wanna talk us out? Do, thanks Gordon. And thanks Kristen as well for presenting today. And thank you all for joining us 
um, for this California Housing Community Development Community Workshop offered through the Emergency Solutions Grant Coronavirus Relief Consulting and Staffing Services contract. We do have more sessions. Uh, go to our training website if you would like to sign up. I think we have three or four next week. Uh, and please do uh, fill out the California HCD Public Online VAWA survey uh, as you're able. Uh, thanks for attending today. We will see you next time.